Hello everyone again. <laughs> this is presentation number seven from my part. I hope you can still follow. Um, so far I've been talking about um, AFROWIS, AFREMAS, uh, data standards, data quality control. Uh, my final presentation for this week is actually on uh, the other side of the data management, which is the, the social aspects, by which I mean how do you deal with your data provider not on the data level, but on the communication level. How do you communicate with your provider in a, a nice way so you can both benefit from uh, what you are discussing? Okay, I'd like to start with this one because this is a very familiar situation for a data manager. If you ask for someone's data, is that they first want to know what you plan to do with the data. So it's already very important that you have a good background on what your institute is doing, what Afrobis is doing, how the data go to OBIS, how the whole picture is, so you can explain them very clearly, this is what will happen with your data. Now, I'll first do some general slides on the management of data, so you get some background information which you can also use in your communication. And uh, the question that we should ask ourselves is why do we manage data? Why should we manage data? And there's two reasons. The first one is selfish, really from your own point of view, because if you do a good data management of your own data, you can work more efficiently and you avoid that your data gets lost. Second reason is the opposite, is the altruistic reason. If you have good data management, then you facilitate the data exchange uh, with other persons and it's also a way to avoid uh, loss of your data. Now, if you look at this on the long run, then the altruistic reasons not doing it for yourself are actually doing it for yourself. So altruistic reasons become selfish reasons on the long run, okay? Now, why should we conserve data? So we know we have to manage them. But why, sh why should we keep our data? Why not just throw them away after the project or the, or the monitoring campaign or whatever? And it, this has specifically, uh, is specifically linked to the moral obligation that a scientist or data manager should have, specifically regarding the price of data collection. If you just go to the beach with your bucket and your shovel to get a sample, then that's relatively cheap. Imagine going, doing deep sea research, having to have a vessel, going to, for example, the poles or to the deep sea regions, taking your sample there. If you would calculate what that costs, then it's really important that you conserve the data that come from that one specific uh, campaign. Also, the uniqueness of your observations. If you have collected data in 2000, today it's impossible to collect those same data to come to the same results. So that's also important. And also, you want to ensure, again, the long-term integrity of your data. You want to avoid data loss. So this is why we should conserve our data or should put our data in an, uh, in an archive or a system that deals with large amounts of data, which could also be OBIS, for example. Documentation, I've already touched on this, uh, I think, Monday in the metadata. But again, here, it's the importance of the metadata. If you conserve data or if you uh, store data somewhere, have the metadata with it because having the metadata, again, makes you work more efficiently in the future. You can say, perfectly say, this is my data that I collected today. I don't need to write anything down on the methods or the metadata, because I've done it myself, I'll remember. But if you're one year or five or ten years later, you won't remember if you haven't written it down. So that's why it's important to have your metadata documented together with your data and preferably at the same time that you uh, start managing your data. Now, data sharing, just also touching on this, is um, what I want to show here is the sense and the nonsense of data sharing. There's lots of stories and, and quotes uh, floating around on the internet on data sharing. And uh, I'd like to take the example of the stick and the carrot, is what they mostly say. If you approach someone to share their data, you can either use a stick to get the data, which means that you would have um, legal obligations, you would have contracts with your provider that write down every single uh, note, every single worry that you might have about the data sharing. Now, a lot better, in my opinion, is to make use of the carrots. 
is to just make it advantageous for the both parties or for everyone to share the data. And using this carrot actually has to do with what they call the prisoner's dilemma. And I'll just take you to that prisoner's dilemma and then uh, view it from the point of uh, data management. Is any one of you familiar with this prisoner's dilemma? No? Okay. It's more fun. <laughs> so this is how you should see the prisoner's dilemma. It's actually really having two prisoners. Two persons have been arrested, um, go to jail, and then uh, the lawyer or the whatever you call that person is there to negotiate on whether they want to talk or not, whether they want to, um, like, tell their side of the story so that the other person gets a longer punishment or kind of that situation. So the deal that they get is if they would both confess, both say that they were part of the criminal activity, then they each get five years in jail. Now, second situation is that one decides to stay quiet, not say anything, and the other one talks. Because of the fact that the other one talks, he gets the most beneficial punishment, which is go free right away. And the other one that remains silent gets 20 years. Not that perfect situation, but could be possible. Uh, last situation is if they both stay silent. If they both say, we're not giving away the other person, then they both get one year. So if you look at this, what's the most beneficial situation? Very easy. You both stay silent. Then you only get one year, and after a year, you walk. So that would be the best choice, to just stay silent. But from your own point of view, you can say, I'll stay silent. But there's no guarantee that the other person will do exactly the same thing. So the actual outcome of this prisoner's dilemma is actually that the rational choice is to talk. The, ras the rational choice here is to talk, to give away the other one, because if you both talk, you're still off rather okay with five years instead of 20 years and risking that the other one goes free. Okay? So how do we translate this to data sharing? So we saw from the prisoner's dilemma that actually the cheater earns the highest reward. He gets uh, no sentence at all. Okay? So... If you would look at it now from a scientific point of view, you would have scientists A and B, prisoner A and B, having a data set. Scientist A decides to share his data, but B doesn't. What happens is that B can write a paper, have a publication, on the combination of his own data set that he's not sharing with the data set from the other scientist that is sharing. So if you look at the situation, B wins. B is the most profitable person from the situation, okay? That is the whole prisoner's dilemma, but there's a lot of ways to break that, in a sense that as a data manager, you can uh, have a lot of arguments to convince both scientists to share. And this is where I would like to come to with this whole presentation of the social aspects. So breaking this prisoner's dilemma actually starts by building up trust relationships. You have to have trust between you as a data manager and the scientists that you are dealing with. You also have to provide in good data policies. It has to be a good one and you have to be very clear about that. And very important is that you always indicate the advantages of data sharing or data publication. And that can be that if you publish your data set, someone else can use it. So you get citations for your data sets and you can also get co-authorship. Now, this is not easy. I'm, spe I'm speaking here from own experience. This, this is not easy to do. Building up that trust relationship with scientists can take for a very long time before they actually take the step and decide, okay, you can have my data, you can use them within Afrobis or Afrimos or Obis or whatever. So you have to see this data sharing, convincing scientists to share their data as the prisoner's dilemma over and over and over and over again. It's an iterated process that you have to try to break. Now, how do you convince possible data providers? I hope we're Wednesday today, that in the past days, you've already uh, kind of came to the conclusion that this would not be the right way 
kind of like give me your data or die. I think a lot better approach is to go gently, go easy, talk to the people, try to convince people that data sharing is actually a good thing. Okay, so some tips on if you talk to uh, possible data providers. Um, be positive. Always be positive. Never be negative. Just talk about your own experiences. Talk about, you know, make sure that you do know what you are talking about. In the sense that if you refer to Afrobis, do know what Afrobis is about. Do know who the contact person of Afrobis is. If there are other regional nodes that will be set up, know which node you should be linking to and tell the people it that way, that you're working together with a node, that you're part of a bigger network. Always be honest with your data provider. And that includes, if you don't know, then you just say, I don't know. But I will inform, I will look it up, I will let you know. Don't tell them anything that you're not sure about. Always be honest, always be open, even if you don't know. Always uh, also be honest in the sense that um, most scientists or data providers don't want to share because the data are just out there when they share. It's on the internet and they have no control on what will happen with the data. Also be honest in that part, once it's public domain, you have no 100% waterproof um, uh, you have no proof, actually, that the data will never be misused. That's not something you can stop. If someone wants to take advantage or misuse of the data, they will do it anyways. That's a very small chance, but the chance is there. So be honest to your provider if he asks, will nobody will, will make misuse of my data? There's always a small chance. But then again, there's also, as Wart already mentioned, there's a scientific code of conduct, basically, how a scientist um, handles someone else's publications or data by, um, for example, citing in a publication. So there's an ethical approach that's the unwritten rule of how you have to deal with scientific information. So we kind of trust that everyone out there is aware of that ethical code or that ethical approach and should apply it. Okay? Now, also highlight the advantages of the data sharing or the data publishing. If you share your data, if you publish your data, you get a higher visibility, <laughs> guaranteed, because the data is out there, people can find it, people can contact you. There's, through that, there's opportunities for collaboration with other scientists. And the biggest advantage, that's what I find personally, is that the data that are submitted or that are given to you will go through a thorough quality control. This is good for both parties. This is good for Afrobis and Obis because the data gets checked before it gets uploaded. But it's also good for your provider because if he would have made a little mistake or there's a little error that slipped in the data set, most likely the quality control will identify that. You communicate back to your data provider and then he can also correct the data. And when he works again with his own data, it's going to be higher quality than what he had before. Um, also important, and I don't think we've touched on that one yet, is uh, to explain the different options there are for data sharing on the data content level. And by that I mean that a data provider can have a huge data set with very detailed information, but he's not really sure if he wants to share because that's a lot of data and he still wants to do his own research and publications. What you could suggest is that he only shares the presence data. That's still a whole lot of data that becomes available, but on a more general level. Second phase could be like, you have the data on the presence level, two or three years later, you can go back to that provider. Say like, you've seen how it works, your data is available online, has anybody contacted you? Just see how it went. And then you can go a step further, ask now if he would be willing to share his abundance data. It happens, in Eurobis we had cases like this. They start with presence data, two years later we go back, and then they are more familiar with what your system is doing, and they see the advantages, and then they're more open to it. They want to share more. So abundance data would be the second step. If there's biomass data available, you can also ask for that, because OBIS can also capture that. 
You can always say that there's a, a period, a, a moratorium. I don't know if that's the correct English term. It's like a period where you say if your data set is 10 years long, then they say the last two years or the two most recent years cannot yet be shared. They're under a moratorium period. That can be two years, that can be three years, that can be five years. That's a bit depending on the size of the data set in time and also what your provider is, is looking at or what your provider is doing with the data. So then you can also suggest two things. Just, for example, make the data of the last five years not available or only make the presence data of those last five years available. And then year after year, the data can be updated and year after year, you have more data becoming available. Also explain uh, the different options on the data exchange level, which is basically they can hand you the file as it is in Excel or Access and you do the quality control, you do the checking, you do the processing. Um, this is mostly done for the smaller scale data sets, uh, for example, from a, a master thesis, a PhD, or from a research project. Mm -hmm. After the project, it's done. It's not going to be updated or, or changed anymore, and then they just send it to you. Uh, second case is, as uh, Mike explained earlier today, is to set up, for example, an IPT. So you can share your data through IPT. Also very important is some data providers are like, I'm not sharing my data because that's way too much work for me. Then your argument is, it doesn't have to be any work for the, date, for the data provider. The only thing that you ask is once you get the data is that it's available for some feedback. If you find something in the quality control that doesn't make sense, that he's just willing to look at it and to answer your question. That's a very limited amount of work for your data provider. Extended is if they would work through IPT, then they are still responsible for their own data set. That involves a lot more work. Okay. Is this clear so far? Okay. Yes? The quality control here is the, it may have a on of the data or the data provider. You can do both. As data owner, you can use this, the web services that were explained earlier today. The data, uh, the data manager can also do that. The data manager will be very happy if the data provider has already done some kind of quality control. Okay? It's always best that the quality control is done on the lowest level possible. Yeah. Because it's the scientists know much more about the data uh, than the data manager who receives the data. Yes. The person who has collected the data, they know much, much more about the nature of the data. And I, I, I did the, that work, I don't think that helped to make the quality control because I did the work. So I think that did the... Yeah, but still, still there is, there is no single data set that is without any error. Mm -hmm. if, I, if you ask me to write 100 scientific names, yeah, I, you can be sure that I made a big mistake. Yeah. Like we are humans, we make mistakes, we're not machines. So it's always good to have some tools. Okay. I'm almost done talking. <laughs> uh, I'll let you do some talking too, in the sense that I've listed a number of responses from scientists if you ask them if they would like to share their data. I'll tell you right away, they're all negative. They don't want to share, and they give a specific reason why they do not want to share. What I'm asking you is to just look at the sentence and see if you can formulate an argument against it. Just if the, uh, if the scientist tells you, I don't want to share because, that you at least can already give an argument that kind of breaks down what he says. So he needs to think about it again and either come up with another reason or say, okay, it's good, let's do this. So the first one would be, so, I'm the data manager, I'm asking you, would you like to share your data? And then the researcher says, no, because people will copy my work from the web and they will just plagiarize it. They will just copy it without acknowledging me. What would a possible response from you as a data manager, what could it be? Not all at once. <laughs> Yes, Sylvie? My, my answer 
thing to do. Yes, I would like to share. I would like to share, but not just to, to share. I would also like to get something back. That is, I will share my, my, my data and then I will share to, uh, with somebody that I know that I can get some uh, scientific knowledge mm -hmm. uh, from that person. Okay. That, that person can help me to write the paper and to publish. Okay, then I would say, just share your data with yes. Afrobis, yes. because if your data goes to Afrobis, yes. it goes into a pool of lots of African data, then you can search this whole pool of data sets, find someone, a provider from another data set, contact him, work together. Okay? Now, if someone tells me, people will copy my work from the web, just take it and plagiarize it, I would say not completely true. Because in this case we're talking about a data set, but if that researcher has already published, written a publication on this, I think in 95% of the cases the publication is also available on the web, can also be copied and plagiarized if they don't follow like the ethical code of conduct. So that's an argument against what they say here. Once you say that, they'll start thinking about it. Okay? Second one could be, this is an easy one now, after three days of, of training. Where can I publish data? Journals will not publish my raw data. What would you have as an argument against that? There you go. <laughs> Obis publishes data, yes. Um, so that's where can I publish? And then the second one, journals will not publish raw data is not entirely true anymore. There are data journals out there. It was mentioned before, GBIF through the IPT tool offers a uh, data publication data kind of tool. Papers. Sorry? Data papers. data papers can be published on raw data. And with uh, journals like Safety, you can find yes. data. Yes. Yes. So, yeah. Everyone who tells you this, you can just say, not true. Okay? It's my data, why should I make it available? There you go. <laughs> that's true, that's, that's, that's one of the arguments that I hear a lot. It's my data, why should I make it available? And then indeed your response should be, it's not actually your data, it's been paid in most cases by public money, so the public does have a right in some way to uh, have access to it. Yeah. That's a nice one here. The data I used were not my own and I did not get permission to publish them. <laughs> These are actual responses, I didn't make them up. Someone, it's it's actually from the, it's down there, it's a paper by uh, Marco Stello in 2009 who wrote about uh, motivi motivating online publication of data. And what he did is he went to several workshops and conferences and just talked to scientists and these are actual responses that he got. So it's just that you know that I'm not making this up, this is true stuff. So in this case, what what could you say? There you go. And you can already ask yourself, why didn't you ask for permission if you publish on the data? But indeed, you could motivate that person to go back to the person where he got the data from, talk about it and see if there's a way to, to share the data. Now, this is one that I hear very often. I have not finished analyzing the data and I may do further analysis on them. Any arguments against? You can still do it, yes. And this is where you can go back to that moratorium period I was talking about. Say, okay, this is good. How much time do you think you would need to get it published? If they say 10 years, say no. Because <laughs> it, it, it will never happen. And there's, um, I don't remember if it's astronomy or geophysics or something. There they say, or they have a period of one year. Once you finish collecting and processing your data, you should count for one year to be able to publish it. 
in most cases, if you haven't published within the year, you'll never publish because it, it's too long. The, the time period gets too long. You start being engaged in other activities and you don't have time to go back to your data. So it's two things. You can propose the moratorium periods. What you do then is then check the name, put next to it, have to email again in one year time to see how it's going and then start talking about it again. Somebody else will use my data and benefit from this. And then that was the worst case scenario. They might be from a commercial organization and earn money on my data. How can you argument against this? Oh, yes, you can, Sylvie. <laughs> I see you going, no. <laughs> but yes, you can. First, the first part. Somebody will use my data and benefit from this. If a scientist publishes a paper, this is actually what he wants. You want your publication, you want your results to be used by someone else so they can benefit from it. If you can do it for your publication, then why not do it for your data? Because someone else can make use of your data and can benefit from it, but you will also benefit from it because they have to cite you, they have to acknowledge you as being the provider or the custodian of the data. And then the worst case scenario, commercial organization. Oh my, scientists uh, don't like to hear that. Very similar again to the publications. Scientists don't have any problem to publish in journals that people need to pay for to get access for. So that's commercial. So again, the same, if you do it for your research results, why not do it for your data? Someone will benefit from it and let's say, um, just an example, if it would be a non-for-profit organization that, um, no, more concrete example, we have mammal observations, for example, a data set, and there's this organization that does whale watching, but only recently started. They actually want to see what has happened before in that specific region, uh, any observations, any specific species that have been observed. They can make use of that data to build on their own data or, or cruises or whatever they want to do and if they make any money of that they will invest it in their own company again and then you can talk to that company and see if they are willing to share the data that they will be collecting during their activities so again you can completely counter this kind of argument we, we have i mean that's one of the big arguments that we come across and that's because um, a lot of environmental impact assessments are being mm -hmm. done and of course they need data. And, but I think the problem is normally the way the consultant, consultant comes to ask for the data. But I mean, in our institute, if someone asks for data, people are, you know. Like, oh, no. Yeah, because it's consultants who sort of, and then they actually normally ask for products that don't even ask for the data. Yeah, okay, that's true too, yeah. But they, I mean, yeah, a consultants, but on the other hand, that sort of benefits the nation. Mm -hmm. You want a proper EIA to be done. Yeah. You know, yeah. And why should they recollect the data if you have it? Mm -hmm. And again, it's also communication. If you really have a consultant coming to you asking for your data, it's two people talking to each other. You can always come to some kind of agreement and, and be open for discussion. It doesn't have to be yes, no, and no, we don't do it, but talk about it. And while talking, you can see like, okay, this is what they need and this is how we can eventually benefit from it and try to get an agreement there. It's not wrong to put anything on paper. It's not because I said that the, the, the stick shouldn't be used. Sometimes you do have to have something on paper, like for data products or how everyone should be acknowledged, but specifically for data products then, not for the, for the raw data. It should be all pretty straightforward. I mean, with the raw data, it comes back that many people then say, okay, the raw data, and here are my paper sheets that you can have. <laughs> That's because funny. A lot of times it's invested in digitizing. It's still raw, but, you know, a lot of time and effort has been. Yeah. And, and it normally comes when the consultant comes and, oh, I need your data. I mean, I said that the next time I show them, here's the archive, there's your data. Go, back. Go, Go for on. it. <laughs> yeah, no. What you actually should do is you know that there are this... There are commercial companies interested in your data. Well, that's that's the best way that you can promote yourself. Eh? What you need to do is you organize a stakeholder meeting. You invite people from the government at the same time, and you discuss like, look, 
these commercial companies, they want to do mining and uh, but they need data. They need they need to be uh, implementing impact assessment. I have data, but I don't have time to, to devote all my time to provide a nice product for the small impact assessment. Uh, can we come to an agreement? 50% uh, is paid by the government, 50% is paid by the commercial company, and then we can, we, we can maybe we can hire someone to help you. And this is, for me, if a commercial company contacts me and wants the data, for me that's an ideal scenario to ask for money from the commercial company and the, and the government at the same time. So you should try to, to get the benefit out of this and not just not just push push this opportunity away. And there's a bit of history. We also have a lot of even the Benguela Current Commission, which we mm -hmm. are partner, whatever you call it. They some sometimes employ consultants who come via ten different doors mm -hmm. to us again to ask for our data. I mean, as I said, my institute, and I'm also as I said, I've, I've sent consultants to the archive and said, you can have the data, you know. But it's a matter of approaching. Yeah. Oh, that's true. That's true, and that's that's why I stress the importance of those social aspects. Don't go to someone and go like, "Give me your data," or "Where's my data?" Is a student question. They come to your office. Where's my data? <laughs> <laughs> so you have to. It's. I'm only, I'm only student. <laughs> <laughs> and it comes from both sides. Yeah, you can be very offended if someone comes up and asks you a certain question. It's mostly not the question, but the way they ask the question. And that's why it's important if, if you talk to people to, to get data into Afrobis or other systems is be prepared. Prepare yourself on what you want to achieve because you will know the person, maybe not personally, you know who he is and you know what kind of data he has or she has. Be prepared in a sense that you know what is there and what your minimum would be that you would like to get. And if you have that, you can kind of build up the conversation or the discussion. It's uh, how it should work. I have some more. The publisher may profit. Any argument against this? I just gave it to you, the previous slide. <laughs> it's the same, you put your research results in a journal Publisher profits from that because, like I said, in most cases you need to pay to get access to that publication. It's the same for data. So if you do it for your research results, why not do it for your data? I fear my data will be used for an incorrect purpose. They will be misused. Sometimes, be honest, yes. But also here, um, the data will be used for an incorrect purpose that might already not be the case if your metadata are very clear. If your metadata already mention the limitations of your data, then this will already kind of counteract on this argument. Your metadata are necessary to get a good um, understanding of your data. And if the metadata are elaborate, very clear, then a user can get from the metadata already, I can use the data for this, but not for that, because the metadata says that it cannot be used for that specific reason. Okay? I do not have the skills to publish data on the internet. <laughs> Send me an Excel spreadsheet would be a very good argument. Um, I would also say everybody can use Google if you can use Google, you can publish data on the internet. And if you get an argument like that, just go like, give me whatever format you have and we'll process it for you. That's the best way forward. I disagree because I have a problem with someone who wants to give me a field book with codes. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I, we really got that with a huge data set, that problem. That we were to yeah. Then you actually need to sit together with that yeah. person to go through it. Okay, yeah. That's a lot of work, but it's really... Yeah, okay. <laughs> well, I can imagine there might be still some people out there that are not familiar with the internet, but I guess the further we go in time, the less that will happen. <laughs> Intellectual property rights is also something that we hear a lot. Um, people are scared that their property rights won't be respected. Um, 
they say that it differs between countries. So if I make them available in Belgium, for example, then the policy won't be the same in Africa or something like that. What I would say here is that intellectual property rights protect your data. If you have good metadata, if you publish the data, it has a citation and that's universal. Even for the same for publications, if you make use of it, then you cite it or you acknowledge it or you reference it. Again, this is of course also one that once your data are out there on the internet, there's always someone, if they really want, that can make this uh, misuse of your data. But again, if this would happen, you get in the case of plagiarism. And if your data is open, then the chances that someone notices that are a lot bigger, so they can actually do something about it, because that's illegal. Okay? I will not get recognition for creating the data. What would you say to someone who says that? Prakash, you're laughing. Come on. <laughs> what would you say? It's not that hard. <laughs> we've, we've been through this all week. You should know by now. <laughs> You be cited. If you provide the citation, someone uses your data, they need to cite you. So they need to recognize your uh, contribution in creating the data. Okay? And there's plenty and plenty more. So what I would advise you to do is I, um, I gave the publication to uh, Claudia. Claudia will make it available on Ocean Teacher. It's an open access uh, publication so you don't need to worry about having to pay to to get to it I really strongly advise you to read it because it really deals with online publication with the possible arguments that someone can give you how you could reply to them to to make their argument less strong and to even convince them to consider sharing data I'll just have some benefits listed here they're also in the publication so uh, you can see it from, from different perspectives. So it can be a benefit for an individual scientist in his role as a data creator. Because if he shares his data, uh, he can have additional publications, more citations, wider recognition is also very important, and invitations to meetings to collaborate, to provide consultancy on his own data. Or if someone else would like to set up a similar data set or similar uh, monitoring campaign, then he could give advice on how he has done it and how they should uh, or how they could improve it. Because mostly if you do something, you have a data set, then afterwards you can always think like, mm, maybe I should have done this or that different. So that person is really in the position of giving you or giving someone else advice on, on how to deal with it. Yes. For our institution, you can add one. You can refer it to the consultant to the website you know, where the data is, so they don't need to come to us anymore. Just say yes, we can have it. Just let yep. it it's available there. <laughs> yep, that's true. Um, also, for um, a scientist in his role as a researcher and an author, um, just as with a scientific publication, the author or the creator of the data will be known from the citations that will appear everywhere, so he can be contacted for more information. It also adds authority to their data set, and it indicates the quality, because I think it has been mentioned before, if we have a really, 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 really bad data set that we cannot do anything with, because the quality is so low or the information is not there, the information that we need to interpret the data, then that data set does not go online. So we do have a certain standard in the sense that the data that go online have a certain quality and make them usable for other people. Also for editors and peer reviewers, um, if the data is shared, then it has gone through a certain quality control, which means that it's an independent verification of the research and the findings. And if they would, if the data would be shared, the reviewer could get access to the data and could actually do a double check on the research results that uh, they want to publish. So it's a double check also on the results to avoid 
Uh, we had a case, I think, in, was it Belgium? Not that long ago that they discovered that some researchers had been frauding with their data. And it's only when the data were getting open access or getting shared that someone else could check this and that this fraud was actually discovered. So this is a good argument. For the scientific community in general, data can be reused. It can be both for similar or for completely new purposes. Data can be integrated with other data. This is what Sylvie was referring to. As a researcher, you want to get access to other data so we can do an, an maybe a similar analysis to what you have done yourself, but then on a, on a larger area. And uh, resources, I can't remember why I put that there. It'll be in a paper, read it. <laughs> For funding agencies, um, sharing data brings in the long run a financial return. So this is again, as data can be used and reused, in the long run, you can get a financial benefit from it. Governments, um, governments mostly pay for the data that we create. So if we share them or make them publicly available, they're easily ac uh, accessible for advisors and so on. For society in general, sharing your data, being able to combine them with other data just leads to better science which is something that we all want. Uh, we've mentioned this already uh, briefly. Society is a really important aspect in data management and data sharing, because in most cases, the data that have been collected have been paid for by those public funds. They have, or they have been collected for the public goods uh, related to public health, to safety, to environmental monitoring, uh, Think about the global, what is it now? No, the good environmental status, the GES that we have in Europe. Um, payment, uh, by payment I mean it can be directly paid for by the government or you can have an indirect payment uh, through university salaries. As a PhD, you get paid by the university, so indirectly again, people or public funds are paying for uh, the creation of your data. Um, Two arguments, open versus closed data. This is also from the paper from Marco Costello, so you can uh, read it again afterwards. They've done a test on this. If you have an open data set and a closed data set, what happens in the long run? And it has been shown that open access data gives significant economic benefits. Although you wouldn't think of that right away, it is true. If you have open access data, you get benefits in the long run. And then this is a very important one, small versus large data sets. Sometimes I get the argument like, why do I need to share my data set? It's only a very little data set, very small scale. What's the benefit compared to all the other big data sets that are already out there? And it's very important if you ever get that response from a, a provider that the size of the data set does not matter. A small scale data set can sometimes have a much bigger impact when it's shared than a large monitoring data set. So the size is not an indicator for the value of the data. Really remember that. And I think that was the last one. Are there any questions on this? No? I would just say, read the paper on the plane home, <laughs> study it, use it. So, no, then I'm done talking. <laughs> yes? Okay. Mm -hmm. <laughs> no, I understand. So let's say the... Okay, the publication, the research publication, we can compare this with the, the nice lunch we had, the, was it the, the, the fish and the, and the vegetables? It's ready, it's completely ready. And that research publication also includes your own findings, yes? Like you have your data, you process them, and then you have some findings or some theory that you tested, and you can give your conclusions on that. But in your paper, you will never give your raw data. What you will do in your paper is give some summary table, maybe, saying I found in total 
uh, 30 species at location A and 25 species at location B, for example. And that's, that's your finished product, that's your dish, that's what you want to share with the people. But I don't think it's correct to see your complete data set as not being valuable or not being ready. Because at a certain point, you finish your data set, you finish your analysis, and then your data are in the best possible uh, quality and the best possible format. Yes? Those data can be very valuable for someone else to combine them with their own data to come to a whole different products that can be compared to your dish or your research publication. It's, uh, I, I understand what you mean, but I don't think it's completely correct to see your data as not ready and shouldn't be shared. Because you're working on a different level. With your research publication, you really want to distribute the, the findings and your knowledge on the subject, while your data set is the raw data, as is. No interpretations, uh, no statistics done on it, and that can be very valuable for someone else. So you should see the two next to each other, comparable and both equally valuable. Does that answer more or less 